Hello, I'm Kendall House, and welcome back to Evolution and Human Behavior. This week we're going to look at evolutionary psychology, human behavioral ecology, what we mean by an adaptive behavior, and how we can study them. I hope you enjoy it. This presentation is called Proximate versus Ultimate. What's it all about? And the reason we're addressing this is you can't go very far at all in evolutionary studies of human and animal behavior without encountering references to proximate questions or proximate explanations or proximate causes, as well as uh, the idea of ultimate questions and ultimate explanations and ultimate causes. And we're not so worried here about the difference between the question and the explanation and, and the cause. But what we're interested in is the distinction between the proximate and the ultimate, uh, which extends across uh, the questions, explanations, and causes. So this distinction derives from a classic paper by Ernst Mayer in 1961. And this paper was called Cause and Effect in Biology. And in the paper, uh, Mayer talked about causality in biology and how it differed from classical mechanics. So in saying that biology had a different kind of cause than mechanics, he argued it had nothing to do with teleology. So teleology is the idea that something happens for a reason, for a purpose. And he said teleological thinking is not really the key here. Um, instead, um, the difference is that evolutionary theory cannot predict the future. And so that evolutionary theory is about understanding the influence of the past on the present, but we have no idea uh, what's going to happen in terms of evolution in the future. We can probably make some reasonable guesses, um, but there's no way to know any more than to predict history. Now, what really came out of this paper, uh, what really stuck uh, was his distinction between ultimate and proximate explanations. So he discusses this uh, with reference to a yellow warbler, this little bird. And it had been coming to his deck. Uh, he taught at Harvard, so he lived in Massachusetts. And uh, this warbler had been showing up on his deck all summer. And then on August 25th, it flew off and it never came back. And so Mayer had this question, why did the warbler uh, migrate on August 25th? How can we explain that? And he said, well, one way we can explain it, and this is the crucial distinction, is in terms of the proximate causes, uh, why the warbler flew south. And this has to do with the length of the day, the temperature, and the direction of the winds. Either one of those are all in some combination. Uh, the warbler uh, responds to the shortening days or the cooling temperatures or the shifting prevailing winds. And this gives the warbler a cue about when to start migrating south. And uh, on August 5th, 25th, presumably, these environmental cues came into alignment. And that's the proximate cause of the migration of the, of the warbler. But Mayer argues we can also ask questions about what he called the ultimate cause, ultimate causes of the migration of the warbler. And this is simply that had it stayed for the winter, it would likely starve to death. And so natural selection then had adapted warblers um, through differential survival over many generations so that they were attuned to these uh, uh, cues and they chose to leave before their food supply declined. So the difference here is between functional biology and proximate causes how does a warbler know when to head south? What are the physiological processes that interpret these environmental cues and allow the warbler to make the decision? Whereas the ultimate cause is from evolutionary biology and, and it's the answer to the question, why would a warbler know that? How would a warbler come to know that in the first place? 
Now, an example related to humans comes from page 169 of Sarah Hurdy's book, Mothers and Others. And here she notes that men as well as women are physiologically altered by exposure to babies. So this is really interesting. You pick up a baby and you hold it, and your physiology changes. Uh, the proximate reason for that is that hormones, uh, a hormone called prolactin, rises in in your blood, and this changes your behavioral response. Uh, you become more nurturing, and this happens to both men and women. Although prolactin levels increase more in women than men, uh, the more that men hold babies, the more prolactin they release, and the more caring and nurturing they become. Now, functional biology can explain how that happens by looking at this hormone, prolactin, and how different levels of prolactin uh, affect our behavior. That's functional biology, uh, whereas evolutionary biology can explain why it happens. And presumably, this is because individuals who had that response to prolactin when they held babies had higher reproductive success in the past. So the functional biology provides a proximate explanation of how human physiology is altered by holding babies, whereas evolutionary biology provides an ultimate explanation about why that happens in the first place. So this principle, then, this distinction holds generally. Proximate causes refer to things that functional biology can explain, how our bodies work and how that influences our behavior, whereas ultimate causes have to do with evolutionary biology, and it can explain why our bodies work that way. Um, why did they, our bodies come to take the forms they did in our behaviors? Now, obviously, we need both functional and evolutionary biology to have a complete understanding. But a key point here is that we can study either one of these independently. It's not ideal, but uh, until we know how they fit together, we can go down one path or the other. Now, here it's uh, worth noting that for a long time, you didn't get much of the way of an ex exploration of ultimate causes or evolutionary uh, questions. And uh, this is the case even though the origin of species was published clear back in 1859, and what's called the modern synthesis occurred in the 1930s, and that's when population genetics was unified with Darwinian uh, thinking. But despite this, uh, you often didn't have any discussion of evolutionary questions in many biology classes for many decades. And my own uh, education illustrates this. In high school biology, not only did we never discuss Darwin and evolution, we never got through Mendel because we were just starting to discuss Mendel's uh, rules of inheritance and some students became very upset um, that this was evolution. Um, in their own minds, they thought that Gregor Mendel, the monk, uh, was a Darwinian, and the biology teacher simply abandoned the topic. That was in high school. And then I got to college, and I don't recall a discussion of evolution. It was probably there, but mostly what I recall is a lot of very detailed uh, uh, functional biology that I was uh, in, led to memorize. So the first exposure I had to evolutionary thinking in a classroom, I read about it on my own, but in a classroom it was a course in physical anthropology, and that was part of what led me to study anthropology. So in descriptive biology, in courses that focus on that, ultimate questions often come last or not at all. And this pyramid shows that. Uh, one way that you can approach things is to have this huge influence emphasis on proximate anatomy and physiology and biology and work uh, primarily in, in the level of functional biology. And then you might give a little attention to ontogeny or how we develop and phylogeny and how we're related to other living things. And those certainly have some evolutionary implications, uh, but you might never get to the ultimate why questions. And in fact, uh, you can teach a lot of functional biology and never discuss evolution. For example, uh, you can go over Linnaean taxonomies, which kind of lead uh, this whole evolutionary question. 
Uh, you can just stay with functional anatomy and physiology. Uh, you can even discuss chromosomes and DNA and Mendelian genetics and hardly mention evolution. Um, but if you do bring in evolution, it integrates and changes your understanding of everything. And this is uh, terribly important. You're missing out on a great deal uh, without evolution. So the goal of evolutionary biology is the integration of biology. And a, um, a famous statement uh, by Theodosius Dobzhansky, who was a geneticist in 1973, um, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And this is also discussed as consilience, the unity of scientific knowledge. If you're interested, there's a very good book on this by Edward O. Wilson uh, called Consilience. So in this class, uh, that pyramid that I showed is kind of inverted. We aren't going to have much time to talk about proximate causes. And indeed, much of the proximate uh, workings of how our behavior is shaped is still rather poorly known. Um, instead, we're going to focus on ultimate questions and ultimate causes and uh, relate those to uh, our discussions of ontogeny and phylogeny, uh, which you'll learn a lot about in uh, reading Mothers and Others. And also, uh, what we do discuss approximate biology will always relate it to ultimate causes. So how does evolution change everything? Well, here's an example. Uh, we all know that humans follow a pattern of development. Uh, the human life cycle is a biological cycle, and it has clear stages of infancy and childhood and adolescence and adulthood and senescence as we get old. And an evolutionary perspective on ontogeny, on our life cycle and development, this is called life history theory. And when we start looking at humans from the perspective of life history theory, we understand our life cycle much differently. We have different questions. And uh, one uh, a hypothesis developed from human life history theory that we're going to discuss is called the grandmother hypothesis. And this tries to explain two things. And the first thing is, compared to other primates, uh, human females have a very long post-reproductive life. So there's something called menopause. And then for several decades after that, uh, human females go on living. Uh, chimpanzee females really don't have menopause because they tend to die uh, when they reach the end of their reproductive life. And up to then, their life uh, history is very similar to humans. So the first question is, why do human uh, women uh, live much longer uh, than other primates? A second feature that distinguishes humans when we look at us in comparative perspective is the long period of childhood dependency. So relative to other primates, uh, human uh, children are dependent on parental care for a much longer period before they start being able to take care of themselves. And uh, the grandmother hypothesis argues there's a connection between these. The reason why uh, this long post-reproductive lifespan evolved in humans was that it was selected for because those grandmothers uh, increased the likelihood of survival of their grandchildren who were dependent on others to care for them. And another example, we could look at uh, phylogenies connecting humans to chimpanzees and other primates, but we've kind of done that. And uh, here I'm going to focus on a medical implication. So this is a family tree of viruses. And these viruses uh, cause measles and mumps in humans and other organisms. And measles and mumps in the past were fatal diseases very often. So now we're all immunized. Uh, but it's very helpful for us to realize that these are viruses that are evolving. And also that different viruses are related on a family tree like different primates are and different living things. And we have to understand those family relationships among viruses and also that they're evolving and changing if we, can, if we want to uh, maintain control of diseases and successfully respond to them. We can't just assume that the, that the virus is a fixed thing, that there's a fixity of viruses. Um, they're created once separately and they last forever, and that's not the case. Uh, one virus gives rise to another, and mutations occur, 
and they appear in new forms, and we have to be able to understand that. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.